Well, good morning, church. How are you? Good morning. How are you? <laughs> well, good to see you guys. It's so great to have you all here in the Great Hall at Park Cities Baptist Church. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, we want to uh, welcome you to our venue here at Park Cities. Uh, if, you're jo- if you are joining us for the first time, by the way, we're, we're in a brand new series uh, called Paradox, and it's a, it's a series that we're going through where we're looking at 1 Timothy, and really this series is all about the values of the kingdom of God and how it's, it, a lot of it is so contrary to what we see in the world. So just want to do a quick recap here as we uh, start our time. Uh, some topics that we've covered so far, we've talked about truth. And, and in, in the midst of false teaching and false teachers in chapter one. And then we talked, about, um, we talked about power and strength through what the church does when it gathers in chapter two. And then at the end of chapter two, we talked about unity in uh, an age of disunity. And speaking of last week, if, if you are unable to hear uh, Pastor Jeff's message on how important women are to the life of of the church, please do. I highly recommend that you listen. I, you know, this is such. This was such an important message for our church, but I would say it's also a very important message for the church, capital C. And so, please do take a listen. So that brings us to our topic and passage today. We'll be looking at First Timothy chapter three, verses one through thirteen. So if you have your Bibles. Uh, your iPads and your phones or what have you, go ahead and turn there. And one of the things that we've been doing uh, within each service is reading the text out loud together. So what I want to do today is I want to start off our time in, in reading our passage. So uh, as you are able, church, could we, could we stand in reverence for the word of God as we read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13? So this is the word of the Lord. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil." Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things." Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Church, let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for this time of worship that we're able to give to you. Lord, as we dive into your word, I pray that we would be open-hearted. Lord, that our hearts would be wide open to receive it. Lord, we wanna leave this place praising you, thanking you. The one thing in our minds is, is to say, what a great God we follow and serve. How wonderful is our God. And I pray that as we leave with praises coming out of our mouths. I pray also, Lord, that we would leave transformed. As I often pray here, I pray that we would leave here different than when we came in, that we would be transformed because of you, because of your word, because of what you have done and what you are doing in our hearts right now. So we are grateful. Be lifted up. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. 
Well, it is a joy to be with you all here preaching in the Great Hall. If, if you don't know me, I'm, my name is Han. I'm a staff member here. I'm the worship pastor here at the Great Hall. And normally, uh, I'm up here with the worship team, and uh, I'm, I'm singing and, and playing guitar, and, uh, and it's, it's my joy to do so. Um, and, and I've been doing this uh, for quite some time, uh, but I would be the first to tell you that the more I learn about worship and worship leading, the more I realize I don't know. Uh, I, I'm learning, I'm constantly learning, and I'm constantly reading, I'm constantly trying to understand how to be a better worship leader, how to be a worshiper uh, from the heart. And so, um, you know, funny enough, though, a lot of the, the wisdom, the, the greatest gems that I've received uh, did not come from wor- other worship leaders or older worship leaders or musicians, although I've gotten tons of great wisdom from them. The, the best gems of wisdom that I've ever gotten actually came from my senior pastors, uh, who I see as the worship leader of the church. I see them as, as people who have been uh, entrusted with the task of, uh, of leading the church into God's presence alongside uh, the people that you might see uh, singing or playing an instrument. Now, there was one pastor I served under. Um, he was my senior pastor when I was first given the opportunity to lead a team of my own. And it, it, was a, it, it was an exciting time because it was a time where I was just so hungry to learn about everything regarded, regarding leadership. I mean, I was reading leadership books. At the time, I had started my leadership studies program at DBU. I was, everything was just about leadership. I was reading books. It was just a wonderful time. And so you can understand that for me, as a young a 20-something worship leader, all I wanted to do was just ask questions about leadership. How do you become a better leader? And so uh, growing up, I remember hearing things like, well, you gotta, you gotta talk more. Talk louder. Be clear. Don't be such an introvert. Be bold. Be brave. Demand to be heard. Speak first and often, even if you don't know what you're saying. Just... <laughs> Just say something, right? Just stop being an introvert. And, and I'm sorry, guys. I'm just an introvert. That's just who I am. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for it. Uh, I've learned over the years that there are leaders in all shapes and sizes, so be encouraged if you're an introvert. Any intro- introverts out there? That's okay. You don't have to. Okay, that's fine. It's all right. I, I get it. I get it. I get it. Um, so you can understand that when I went to my pastor, I, I was expecting him to say something like, hey, these are 10 secrets of leadership that no one will ever tell you. Or I expected to hear something like, well, here are the five things that you want to say to your biggest critics to win them over. I mean, these are things that you might hear in a podcast now or, or maybe in a book. Or I mean, some of you guys are following you know, Christian leadership podcasts, and that's cool. Um, but, but that's kind of what I was expecting to hear. Rather, uh, I actually heard two words that I heard over and over and over again that seemed to be the theme of my pastor's leadership training to me. And those two words were, follow well. Follow well. That was his leadership lesson to me. If you were to put a subtitle to that, it would be, if you want to be an effective leader, learn to follow well. If you want to be an effective leader, learn to follow well. So today, I want to talk about what was essentially taught to me in those years. Uh, as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, I want to talk about something you may not hear very often, something you may not hear in these leadership podcasts that you might listen to, uh, something that I will hope ultimately will keep your eyes on Jesus as you seek to be a better leader in your work, in your school, in your homes, and here at church as well. Today I want to talk about something called followership. No, not leadership, although I'll, we'll get there. Followership. Uh, what I want you to see in our passage today is the fact that Paul is painting a picture here of two recognized positions within the church. What, what I don't want to do here is break down each and every facet of each qualification. We don't have enough time for that. Neither do I want to give you the impression that I'm only speaking to deacons uh, and those who might be considered overseers. Today is about all of us. 
It's about all of us. Never mind our title or responsibility within the church if you happen to have one. In my mind, these are qualifications or, or components of a growing disciple. By the way, if you're not an overseer or a deacon or you have no ambition to be a deacon or an overseer, uh, you know, and, you, and maybe you struggle with some of these qualifications. Maybe you are kind of an angry person. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you have issues with being gentle. Uh, maybe you are a recent convert. Well, well to you, I, I, you know, I'm not saying that you can't follow Christ. I mean, you can and you should. I mean, we, we struggle daily. We struggle daily. There, there are many things that we struggle with, and yet we are called to press on. We are called to continually imitate Christ, as Ephesians 5.1 tells us. And so I, I want to emphasize that this message is about all of us. And I believe that as we do that, we should do what Christ has called us to do in John 12, 26, which reads, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So in an age obsessed with leadership, I want to shift our focus on following. The other side of it, right? Following or followership. Now, I'm not sure if God has called you or will call you to be a deacon or overseer within the church. Perhaps, perhaps he is. I don't know. Maybe there's a tug in your heart. Maybe that will be the case today. But I am sure that God has called you to follow him. So here's where we're headed today. As we look at 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, I want to show you that what we see in our passage are not just a list of qualifications for leadership positions, but also values of someone who follows well. So today we're saying that our passage reveals the following followership values, commitment, authenticity, and Christ-centeredness. Commitment, authenticity, and Christ-centeredness. And with each value that we mention, I hope the wisdom that was given to me many years ago to follow well becomes clear and clear to you. So let's start with that first followership value, talking about commitment here. Throughout our passage today, we, we see some very specific behaviors uh, that serve as qualifications for this leadership position. Now, uh, for example, verse two mentioned that an overseer should be Sober-minded, self-controlled, verse 3 mentioned, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Also, verse 8 mentioned that deacons should not be addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. These are all very good behaviors and rightly mentioned. But do behaviors like this alone necessarily mean that a person is qualified? In painting uh, his portrait of an overseer and deacon, Paul provided some traits and behaviors that one would see in such a person. But let's zoom out a bit. Let's zoom out a bit and see that certain behaviors exist in a person because of a lifestyle a person has committed to. Uh, to be specific, this is a lifestyle that a disciple would adopt as he or she follows Christ. You see, followership is not just about doing what you're told. That's what I initially thought. I mean, it is, but there's so much more to it. Followership, as Linda Hopper, she's a scholar on this issue, she rightly said this. She said, when Jesus of Galilee said, come follow me, he did not seek blind obeisance, sycophants, or toadies. He knew that his path would be treacherous and that making a decision to follow required personal discernment and commitment to God. This is not about behavior modification or just a look at outward deeds to obtain some title, but a decision to commit to a God who calls you into a life of total devotion to him, to the lordship of the one who is in fact the head of the church. So you see, followership is not just about doing what you're told. It's so much more than that. You know, Jesus says in John 14, 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There is a cost to following Christ. Let me remind you, 
And the followership that Paul is alluding to here is the kind of commitment that is not only reflected in the behaviors that we see in our passage, but in the lifelong commitment to the God who asks us to bear our own cross. Church, this is how we follow well. Second value that I wanna address is authenticity. You know, there was a pastor that I served alongside when I was in the West Coast, and uh, there was something that he would say constantly. I mean, I mean constantly, like annoyingly. He would say, my goal in life is to be the same man at home as I am at church. In fact, the first time I met him, that's how he introduced himself. Hi, my goal in life <laughs> is to be the same man at home as I am at the church. I thought that was unusual, but I, you know, there was no doubt what his mission in life was. You know, for both overseers and deacons, Paul mentioned the home life, which I think is very interesting if you think about it, and how it's important to be able to manage their homes well, right? In verse four, verse five for overseers, and then in verses 11 and 12 for deacons. Now, I know that no family is perfect, right? And that there are times when the family uh, and home seem like they're kind of out of control, but I think Paul was onto something when he mentioned this. It's very interesting, now, recently, I've been revisiting a book that I read a few years ago that really changed my perspective on spiritual development and spiritual formation. Uh, it's a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, uh, written by Peter Scazzaro, Pete Scazzaro. And the premise of the book is this, very simply. You cannot be spiritually mature if you are emotionally immature. Okay, let me say that again. You cannot be spiritually mature if you are emotionally immature. And so in the book, he explained the journey he endured to come to that realization, that sobering and humbling realization. He explained that a lot of his emotional deficiencies came through not at church, where he was wildly successful at the time, but it came through at home in, in very real and obvious ways, where his relationship with his wife and his kids were deteriorating. Scazzaro explained in his book that without emotional maturity, you're likely to be trapped in a spiritual rut. How many of you have been there? I have two hands up right now. I have been there many, many times, and this resonates with me. Let me just read a little bit of what uh, he wrote about this. He said, it didn't matter how many books I read or seminars I attended. It didn't matter how many years passed, whether 17 or another 30. I would remain an emotional infant until this was exposed and transformed through Jesus Christ. Now, emotional health, uh, I think, is a, is a topic in and of itself, and, and I can talk about this for, for 30 more minutes, but now here's why I bring this up, though. Like Scazzaro, if who we are at home does not match up with who we are in public, eventually that will show up when we appear in public. It's, it's really interesting to me that in the many traits and qualities that you might think would be in a list of qualifications, Paul devotes a great portion of this to the home. It's very interesting. But if you think about it, it makes sense because we are more ourselves, our true selves, when we are at home, are we not? If the way we follow Christ is reflected in our home, it will naturally be reflected when we serve in public. If we lead the way we follow Christ in our homes in a healthy way, think how authentic and fruitful our experience would be in public. For this reason, finding consistency in the home and in public, it involves a lot of time spent with Jesus, the one we are attempting to follow well. If there were any other times where I felt that who I was at home or in private did not match up with who I was in public, then that's when I would slam the brakes and spend extended time with Jesus. Oh, how I long for that. When I'm in that state, man, I long for that. And so I, my encouragement to you is, is to search your own heart in this manner for this reason as well. Authenticity is seen and felt 
when there is consistency in private and public life. Paul is calling for the kind of followership from leaders that people at home, at church, at school, at work would want to follow. How many of us can manage our households, as Paul says, in a Christ-centered way without following the leadership of the Holy Spirit? How many of us can love our spouse and children at home the way Christ loves us without following the leadership of the Holy Spirit? Church, let's follow well. The last value I wanna talk about is Christ-centeredness. You know, verse nine, Paul tells us that deacons should hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. So here, Paul is saying servants should have Firm, a firm understanding of the gospel, which is often a mystery to those who do not believe, right? The gospel of Jesus Christ and a life that backs that up, which is often reflected in a clear conscience. In other words, servants in the church do what they do with Christ at the foundation of their service. You know, there, there's an aspect of followership here that is not only seen in the title deacon, which in the Greek is diakonos, which literally means servant or server, but in the over-encompassing devotion to the Lord and submission to the gospel. For those who are followers of Christ, you know to keep Christ at the center. So what I'm challenging you to do is not just follow Christ, but what I'm challenging you to do is follow as Christ did. Because while historically, I think it's pretty commonly known that Jesus was a objectively a good leader. He was one of the greatest leaders that our history has ever seen. But he was also, I propose to you, a great follower as well. He was a great follower. He is our prime example of exemplary followership. Check out John chapter six, verse 38. Jesus says, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus also said in John chapter five, verses 19 through 20, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Knowing that our salvation came through the cross, Jesus, to the very end of his life, followed the objectives of the Father. No matter what that would mean for his own life when he was here on earth. So then can you imagine Jesus' life on earth without the followership that ultimately led to his redeeming work on the cross? What if Jesus were not a good example of followership while he was here on earth? What would that mean for his disciples? What would that mean for the, the churches that came through these disciples? What would that mean, and I shudder to think, church, what would that mean for our salvation? If Jesus were not a good follower, would he have gone to the cross? I I shudder to think this. When I think about Jesus as a follower, I I am not only grateful, but I am eternally grateful. Amen? I am eternally grateful for his followership. This is our example, church. To follow the one who came not to do his own will but the will of the one who sent him. We must hold, as Paul said, the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Specifically, we hold on to the gospel of Christ, which is our foundation, our center, and our example of followership. So church, follow well. The qualifications for overseers and deacons that Paul wrote, uh, this is the picture of ideal leadership. But what we're also seeing here is a picture of people who are following Christ well. Uh, What I also want you to see here today is how intertwined followership and leadership are. I mean, you you can't have one without the other. 
Leaders need followers as much as followers need leaders. All right, this is not only important because believers are called to follow the Lord, but because I believe in some form or fashion, we will all be called to lead someone, be it a disciple, be it a mentee, uh, be it employees, and maybe your own children. And we'll be called to do that with or without a title or position to our name. You know, our world is, is obsessed with leadership, I said earlier. Um, you, can, you can see it very plainly. Um, I did an a Amazon search in the book section, and I typed in leadership, and I got like 60,000 titles. I mean, it, it didn't even give you a number. It was just like 60,000 and then the rest, right? 60,000 titles. And so I was very curious. I typed in followership, and I got 263. It might be like one or two more like this week, but I, who knows, right? And I get it, right? It's, it's the hot topic of, of, of podcasts, right? Ministry podcasts that you might be subscribed to. It's, it's the topic of numerous books and sermons and seminars and conferences, et cetera, et cetera. If you wanna be effective, be a student of leadership. And this is something that, that you might've heard before. There are so many people who aspire to leadership positions and titles. And I mean, I get it. It's, it's where the recognition is. It's where the money is. It's the title, the spotlight. It's, it's all there. So I get it. I get it. So I'm not saying that it's bad to study leadership or to try and grow as a leader because we absolutely should, especially if we feel a calling in our life to be a leader of some kind. But I want you to consider this. As you seek to grow as a leader, I, you know, I'm reminded of a quote that I would like to leave with you today that continues to resonate in my own heart as I continue to grow and, and uh, develop as a leader. It comes from uh, Dr. Gene Wilkes, who I had uh, at DBU um, when I was in the leadership studies program. And he, he wrote a book called Leader, Jesus on Leadership, which I highly recommend. And in it, he said this, God doesn't go looking for leaders. God looks for obedient people whom he then forms into leaders. God doesn't go looking for leaders. God looks for obedient people whom he then forms into leaders. As I've said throughout the message, the two words that I was taught in learning how to lead. Church, follow well. They are simple words, but words that describe the goal of those who have the qualifications that we see in our passage and words that describe the goal of a follower of Jesus Christ, the one who leads us all. So here's the one thing that I want to encourage our church to do, and we've been asking you to do the one thing every week in, in all of our messages in this series. Read Galatians 5, 13 through 26, um, and Luke 9, 23 through 25. So I, I want you to read this and, and think on these passages that will help us understand how to stay in step with the Spirit while being encouraged to follow Jesus. So my question to you, church, is how will you follow Jesus this week and allow the Spirit to work through you. Church, be challenged today. Be encouraged as you continue to follow Christ. So my hope is that we can be a church that follows well. Let's pray together. God, we are, we are grateful to be in your presence today. Lord, we ask that you would have your way within us, Lord, as we go from this place. May we be reminded of your lordship. Jesus, we look to you and ask that you would continue to, to direct our steps. Lord, how can we lead others when we cannot follow you or when we do, if we do not follow you? So Lord, my, my prayer and my hope is that we would be a church that follows well, that follows you well, a church that submits to the lordship of Christ and a church that continues to devote themselves in bearing their own cross to live a life that is pleasing to you. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your followership and the way you lead us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.